Well, we are in part three of this series, Walk the Line. And parts one and two were really focused on the foundation that moves us into action that we're going to be focusing in on on parts three and four. In part one, I, well, I shared with you this spectrum that all of us kind of find ourselves on, and we're either to one extreme or to the other. On one side, maybe this is you, you're a well, push around her. And you know you're a push around her if, if people have said to you, uh, you're too nice, people walk over you, or people take advantage of you. And you'll know you're a push around her if people encourage you with love, of course, well, to stand your ground, be your own person, and get a backbone. Now, you might be on the other side, and you'll know that you're a push away or if people say to you, you're closed off, you're distant or you just keep everyone at arm's length and then they encourage you with love of course to well let people in learn to be vulnerable or take your wall down and so in this series we're like let's come in from the extreme and well we want to answer the question how how do we walk with everyone without being walked over like i mentioned part one and two was really laying the foundation to help guide us into action to walk with people, which is parts three and four. And one critical piece of the foundation is, well, love. But it's not just us loving everyone. It has to start with us understanding God's love for us. And that's what we looked at in 1 John chapter 3 and 4. It's about understanding God's love for us. The more we grasp God's love for me, Chris Trothway, God's love for you, right? It starts to build the foundation that moves us into what we looked at in part two. And that's forgiveness. Because God loves us through Jesus and the cross, He's forgiven us. When you place your trust, your faith, your belief in Jesus, sin's wiped away. God's forgiveness is something that should leave you just completely broken, humbled, and filled with joy. God's forgiveness should be something that just leaves you silent and wanting to share the good news about Jesus with everyone. Because you understand his forgiveness. And as we grasp God's forgiveness for our individual sins, for our sin, the debt load that we've racked up, the more we'll extend that forgiveness to well, everyone else. Now in part two, I ended the message with well, sharing this with all of you. I said uh, in part three, we're going to be looking at forgiveness, especially when well, what does consequences like, look like connected to forgiveness? And what does boundaries look like connected to forgiveness? And well, how do you protect yourself and other people from unhealthy people? And how does that get connected to, well, forgiveness? And I said, that's going to be part three. Well, as I started to make my way through the text of part three, I realized I wasn't going to have enough time to We'll lay out where the text is going to take us, which again helps us frame what all of this looks like and give well, this adequate time. So I promise you, this isn't some clickbait thing where in part two I'm like, ah, next week. And then I'm like, ah, oh, surprise, not next week, it's the following week. I will get here in part four. I promise you I'll get here in part four. But I wanted to give this enough space and where the text is going to take us today, enough space. Because again, parts three and four is all about action. It's all about walking with people, understanding again God's love for us and his forgiveness. And the more we grasp his love and forgiveness for us, the more it will move us to love and forgive other people. And this is the walking with. Now, in part two, we looked at this, this, this moment between Jesus and specifically Peter, one of the disciples, but all the disciples were there. And Peter asked a question that we've all asked before. He asked the, how many times must I forgive someone question, right? That is the question. How many times? Jesus said infinite, and then he tells a great story. Again, part two, go watch it if you missed it. The word I didn't focus on is a really important word. The word was then. Then. Right? Because it tells us a lot. That something right before this question, a question we've all asked, how many times must I forgive? Something w was just said. Something was just taught. Something just happened for Peter to step up and say, oh, okay, well, Jesus, I got a question. So we have to pause and go, well, what happened right before this? 
What did Jesus say? What did Jesus teach? Right? What did Jesus demonstrate? What happened to move Peter to be the one, as the other disciples, I think, again, just kind of shove Peter to the front, or maybe just Peter on his own went up and said, hey, I, I got a question into this. What happened right before? Now, in our modern-day Bibles, um, there's section headings. And right before Peter's question, there's something that Jesus taught. And right before that little section of what Jesus taught is a section heading. And the section heading in my Bible says, dealing with sin in the church. Now, I want to pause and explain this because what Jesus is going to teach us, he's going to say something. I just want to make sure that we have a lot of clarity around what it really means. So I want to start there, even though it's going to take us a few moments to actually get to, well, how this impacts. So when you see the section header dealing with sin in the church, right, it might for you kind of go, whew, what does this mean? Depending on your church upbringing, your religious upbringing, maybe you have a pretty clear picture of what this might look like. Not saying what it should look like, but what it did for you as a child or a young adult or even a, as an adult. You see, we have to get some clarity around the word church. Because when we say church in our modern day time, we all have an image. But some 2,000 years ago, when this word church was used, in fact, the word church, which is the ancient Greek word ekklesia, which means assembly or gathering, was only used in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, two times. Once here, uh, that Jesus is going to use it. And another time that Jesus uses when he looks at Peter and says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, my ecclesia. It's only used two times. Because we have to understand that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the story about Jesus, Jesus was building the framework around his kingdom here on earth and forevermore, which the church is going to be a part of. But he hasn't well, completely built out what the strategy of the church, the ecclesia, was going to look like. So this is his beginning of starting to lay down this framework. But it definitely doesn't look what it looks like today. So remember, when, when he says church, it means ecclesia, gathering, assembly, a group of people coming together on purpose, linking arms with God, to be the carriers of the gospel, the good news about Jesus to all people. Now, that will make more sense here in just a few moments. So remember, Peter's asked the question, but Peter's asking the question, how many times must I forgive? Why? Because of, well, what Jesus has just taught, and that's what we're going to look at right now. So in Matthew chapter 18, we're going to be looking at uh, verse 15. And this is what Jesus was teaching that spurs Peter on to ask the forgiveness question. Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins. Now, in the earliest manuscripts, that's what it says. But then in a few later manuscripts, all of a sudden there's a two-word phrase that gets added to it. The two-word phrase is against you. Now, this is important for us to pause on a little bit because, again, the earliest manuscripts doesn't have it. But then it was included, and you need to ask the why question. Why was it included? Well, my opinion in the studying of this is it was included because everyone understood it was inferred. It's what Jesus meant if someone sins against you. And how do you, how do you come to that opinion, you're wondering? Well, remember what Peter's question was. Then Peter comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, how many times must I forgive someone who what? Sins against me. I mean, Peter automatically understood that this line from Jesus meant when someone sins against you, not just some general sin, and, and this text still works for that as well, but we have to understand, Jesus was like, yeah, when someone hurts you, wrongs you, betrays you, lies to you, when they sin against you, it's why Peter asked the question, well, how, how, many, how many times must I forgive someone who sins against me? So I think this is absolutely what Jesus was like, hey, in the context, they sin against you. Jesus says, go. Go. There's the action, right? The action is, hey, immediately, don't, don't wait. Don't, don't, don't. You, you move into action. He goes, go to who? 
He says, well, just between the two of you. It's like, go to that person. Whoever that person was who's hurt you, wronged you, you need to go to that person. Now, so graphically, this is what Jesus was saying. This is you, and all of a sudden, someone hurts you, wrongs you, betrays you, lies to you, whatever they do, right? Close friend, family member, spouse, parent, coworker, boss, I mean, whoever it is, right? If that person hurts you, wrongs you, Jesus says you are to go to that person. But how often does that really happen? Let's be honest. Usually, and again, I, I don't know for you. I'm just speaking for myself. I'm speaking, I've been doing this church thing, which is all about people for a long time. And what I've experienced personally in my life, leading with people, leading within the church, it usually looks something like this. The person wrongs you, and then all of a sudden you pick up your phone and you call your best friend, and you start telling them. You start to rant about what that person did to you. And then you go to the grocery store, and you're walking down, and you grab a watermelon, or I don't know, a a cabbage, and all of a sudden you see someone you know, and they're kind of connected to the storyline, and you start telling them what that person did to you. And then all of a sudden you get home, and you Get on social media and all of a sudden you find that Bible verse or that quote from that person or you just write something and all of it's passive aggressive connected to, well, going at that person that, oh, by the way, you still haven't talked to. And then you take your dog for a walk and you see someone that you really don't know, but you guys have dogs and the dogs like each other. But before you know, you stop, you talk and you start telling them about that person and it keeps going and keeps going. Before you know, you've told everyone except for that person. And isn't that what we do? And Jesus said, no. You go to the person that has hurt you, wronged you, lied to you, cheated you, betrayed you, right? You go directly to that person. And when you go to that person, Jesus says, hey, tell them. Tell them what's going on. He goes, when you go to them, specifically, let's look, let's look at the text. He goes, go And point out their fault. Highlight it. Shine a light on it. Bring them into a conversation. Say, hey, hey, hey. I I just want you to know there's a a relational gap. There's a a relational fracture here. Something's been broken. And I I, I just just want you to know, and I'm here because I want to help repair. I want to help close. I want to walk with. I I want to sit with you and figure this out. Now, seems simple, doesn't it? But why? Why is it so difficult to go directly to the person? Again, I've been in church leadership a long time. I'm just telling you, people don't go to the person. People go to everyone else except for the person. And beside me being a church leader guy, I'm just a person. And I know it's hard for me. So why? Why, why don't we? I think, there's a, I think there's a list of reasons why. This isn't exhaustive. And I think it's a combination of some of these, if not all of them. I think one of the reasons is conflict is just hard, isn't it? It takes a lot of courage, and I mean courage, to go to a person and sit down with them with love and confront the situation. Have an honest, difficult conversation. Whether it's in the workplace, a marriage, parenting, friendship, church, whatever. Whatever the relational dynamic. It takes an extreme amount of courage to step into conflict. And that's why, well, you're either a push away or a push arounder, because both of them, well, you hide from conflict, don't you? It just looks different. Same result. You're just not dealing with the conflict, because it takes a lot of courage. I think another reason why we don't is, well, rejection. All of us, right, we want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We We don't want to have relational friction. And there's this thought in our mind, if I go to the person, what if they reject me? 
What if they shove me away? What if they hold me at arm's length? What if the relationship doesn't get solved? What if? And all of a sudden, all of the what if scenarios tied to rejection. And that's we're really strong emotion. Or maybe it's just risky. It's risky. And the risk is on both sides. On their side, there's a risk. How are they going to respond? What will they and what they do? But on your side, there's a risk. You're putting yourself out there. You're, you're going to have to be vulnerable and tell them, hey, that hurt. There's risk there. And what if other people get connected to it? And what's the relational shrapnel that's going to happen? Or another reason why is, well, sometimes we think we already know their motives. Have you ever said, well, I just know how they're going to respond. I know what they're going to say. Right? You've already scripted the whole conversation and including not just your words, but their words. And you just know exactly what they're going to say. Years ago, I was in a conversation with someone and, and it was a really robust dialogue. I've learned to step into conflict. When early on in my leadership world, I, I would run from it, but I, I've learned to step into conflict. And, and I was stepping in co conflict. I'll never forget this person said to me, like, well, Chris, I know your personality and I know what you think. And I'm like, but that's not what I'm thinking at all. And it wasn't at all. But he had already scripted the exact framework of the conversation and applied to me my own motives. I'm like, I just want to let you know, it's not true. It's not true at all. And he wouldn't even listen to it. He kept saying, well, I know you and your motives. I know you and your personality. I know you. We do that. And well, pride. It's good old fashioned pride. That's lingering in all of us. That's hiding in the dark resources of our broken and fractured soul. And we should pay attention to it. Because pride <laughs> ruins, fractures countless relationships. And it's the one thing we don't pay attention to. It's the one thing we seem to ignore. And Jesus said, hey, hey. Go to the person. Go to them. Tell them what happened. Tell them how they hurt you. Point out their fault to you. And Jesus goes, hey, when you go to them, he goes, if they listen to you, if they hear you, if they lean in, I'm not saying that the whole conversation is easy. I'm not saying that it goes flawlessly. I'm not even saying that they won't get emotional. But the end result, if they lean in and they listen to you, they hear your heart. He goes, you've won them over. Now, you might see the word won, and you're just like, yeah, I want to win every argument. Are you that? In a marriage, you want to win. As a parent, you want to win. Dating relationships. Like, there's something within some of us, not all, some of us, we just want to win. We just want to win. And this is, Jesus isn't saying your goal is to win. What he's saying is, and this is a better word, if you gain. You see, right before this section of teaching, like all of this teaching gets connected together in Matthew 18. Right before this section, you know what he teaches on? A shepherd, 100 sheep, one goes missing. Shepherd goes looking everywhere for the one. And when he finds the one, when he gains the one back, he rejoices. That teaching sets up this. And Jesus is like, hey, hey, when you go and you sit down and you point out their fault and you have a loving conversation with them and they listen to you, they lean into you, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying and I'm sorry and I want to I work on this together, right? You gain. It's not about winning the argument. It's not about winning the fight. It's not about winning the situation. It's about healing a fractured relationship. It's about closing the gap and now you gain that relationship back that's been separated and you should rejoice just like the shepherd who goes find the one rejoiced you should be celebrating the relationship has come back together 
But, Jesus says, if they will not listen, if they lean away, if they argue, if pride fills them up, if they continue to attack you, if they're closed off to you, right? If they don't listen to you, Jesus says, take one or two others along. Find one or two people so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, let's unpack this a little bit. Right? Going privately, keeping the fractured relationship, the sin private, is important. Why? Well, to the unity of all relationships. Because love goes, I'm going to come to you, protect you, because this is just between you and me. It's just like if they don't listen. Now, bring one or two. The circle has to be really small. But it's not bring one or two that are going to be on your side to plead your case, to have your back. That's not the heart in this at all. It's bringing one or two that those people are going to help hold you accountable to what you say, what you don't say, your spirit, your pride, your words, your tone, and to help the other person. Right? Those one or two people are there to help the relationship gain, to be healed, to start being put back together. Now, who, who, who should these people be? One, they should be someone who's a spiritual leader, who wants the relationship to be healed, who understands God's love and forgiveness for them, and they want to see that happen between people. They should be someone that you look at, not perfect, but their pursuit is to love and to live and lead like Jesus. Another person that you could bring into that is a counselor. Maybe in a marriage relationship or a, 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 an adult uh, child and parent relationship or even a kid, and, uh, right? Counselors who are helping people come together to heal, to see different perspectives or a wrong that needs to be healed. But be very selective of the who because they have to want to help both of you heal what's been broken. And then Jesus goes, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Now, this is why the context is so important. It's why I started with the heading, right? It's easy to read those words, and you're like, wait a minute. If there's a sin, and it doesn't get solved, like Sunday morning church service, we're just going to bring people up on stage and tell it to everyone. And there's some churches, hear me on this, some churches, that's what they teach. And I'm like, whoa, time out. When Jesus used the word ecclesia, there was no formal church gathering or service. People were meeting, following Jesus, and he was laying the groundwork of the ecclesia, the, the assembly, the gathering, which for many years was in people's homes. It was families or extended families that were connected together as a church. And then all of a sudden the church started to grow, and then all of a sudden we got buildings and Sunday morning services. But when Jesus was teaching this, what he was saying was, okay, if one or two don't work, now there's a, a larger gathering of people that, again, pursuing loving like God, loving like him, that you need to bring them in. Why? Because we want to help that person. In our modern day, I, I, I would think about this more like in the life group. If you have a life group and all of a sudden, you know, that person in your life group, and they're just not, they're, they don't want to heal the relationship. Now your life group is like, we, we're so committed to both of you. We're willing to sit down with you. Or if you serve on the serve team, it's people on the serve team. Like, we're just so committed to the relationship, right? It's about the gathering. It's not Sunday morning church service. You drag someone up on stage. That's not what Jesus had in, intended at all. And then Jesus goes, if that still does not work, if they still refuse to listen even to the church, the ecclesia, the gathering, the assembly. You just treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And that, that should shake within you. What Jesus is saying is, they're not really a disciple of mine. Now, should you just kick them out? Should you shun them? No. Remember, Jesus taught about how we treat people who aren't disciples of his. 
He's like, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Right? This isn't about just kicking them out and getting rid of them. Now your heart is like, man, we're now praying for their heart alignment with Jesus. I mean, that should crush you at this point. This isn't a revenge thing where you get rid of them. Now your heart breaks for them. What Jesus teaches here is focused on when someone hurts us. But here's what we all know. Yes, people have hurt us. And, and, have you ever, well, have you ever wronged, attacked, betrayed, lied, belittled, powered up against someone? And the answer to that list is yes, we all have. Well, Jesus teaches about that in Matthew chapter 5. This is what Jesus teaches. He goes, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, okay, you're, you have your sacrifice, your, an, your animal, you're, you're at the altar, it's an act of worship, you're giving God your best as an offering to him, it's an act of worship, coming to God, saying, hey, God, man, man, I just love you so much, right? Love drives us to give. He goes, he goes, you're at the altar, you're fueled by love, you have your gift there, and you remember, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. All of a sudden, you just hear that whisper. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, man, I did. I powered up on that person. You know what? When I saw that person, how I spoke to them, oh, man, wasn't right. You know, that person I've gossiped about, I've talked about. I, I, I've created a gap, and they don't even know it. God's like, you're in an act of worship. You're about ready to, God's like, you're about ready to give me your offering. And all of a sudden, you remember you've wronged someone, you've hurt someone, you've sinned against someone. He goes, he goes, leave your gift there. Leave it there. Just leave, get up, leave it there. It'll be back, it'll be there when you, when you get back. He goes, first go and be reconciled to them. Close the gap. Make the relationship right. Ask for forgiveness. Then come and offer your gift. Now there's three very specific actions. In both of these teachings, whether someone has sinned against us or we've sinned against someone, that I just want to highlight. Three very specific actions that Jesus is like, hey, this is how you handle conflict. This is how you handle sin. This is how you ha handle fractured relationships. The first action is this. You, you got to go urgently. You got to go immediately. You got to go. Like, he's like, don't, don't sit around. Don't process. Don't, don't wait months. Right? No, no, no. When there's a gap, you, you got you to close the gap. And here's the thing. We always know when there's a gap. Whether we've created it, the other person created it, or maybe you don't even know, but you can sense it. You know something's happened, and maybe you have no idea. If you've done something, they've done something, but you sense the gap. It's something we talk about on our staff at TCC all the time. It's like, when there's a gap, immediately go to the person and close it. Let's be, I mean, let's be so intentional, right? Because a small gap today becomes a massive canyon tomorrow. Do you have a gap in a relationship? Maybe you've caused it, maybe they've caused it, or maybe you don't know. Jesus would say, go urgently, close the gap, and keep it confidential. Go to the person. Now, you might be thinking, well, Chris, I need some wise counsel. Well, guess what? You can get wise counsel without ever saying the person's name. Do you realize that? 99.9% .9 of the situations you can go get wise counsel and say, I'm dealing with a, a relationship issue and never say that person's name ever. They don't need to know. Now, every once in a while, knowing who the person is or the relationship with the person does help in the counsel. And I would say, that person, you better trust. But here's the thing. If you don't trust them anyway, don't get counsel for them. Like Find someone, a spiritual leader, who's going to keep the confidence and give you godly, spiritual, leadership, relational advice. It's if you have to. Sometimes you just need to go to the person and say, we got, we got to close this. The second critical action, you got to go humbly. You see, the very beginning of Matthew chapter 18, verse 3 and 4 specifically, uh, Jesus is teaching and 
and uh, he, he brings in this whole idea of a child, and then he goes, hey, be humble like a child. Now, this is important because that, start, that, that lays, a, lays a framework for all of Matthew 18. As he teaches through 18, and all of these sections are, well, as they start to connect together, he starts with saying, hey, you should be humble like a child. The older we get, the more our pride grows. And we need to recognize that. But as a child, he says, be humble. Humility is all about lowering yourself to lift someone else up. So what's it about? And Jesus is like, oh, you got you to go and humble yourself. Whether you're in the wrong or they're in the wrong. It's about humility. Jesus embodied humility. So it's why you crawl on, up on a cross to take on your sin and my sin. He humbled himself. So all who believed in him, placed their faith in him, their sin, would be wiped clean. So how do you, how do you stay humble and keep pride at its minimum? You've got to pray. And so many times when there's relationship, uh, re- re- relational conflict, we want to pray for that person Right, to repent for that person, to come beg for forgiveness, that, right? It's like, God, you gotta deal with them. But here's the thing with prayer you can't change that person. You need God to work on your heart. So when you go to that person, pride doesn't creep up. When you go to that person, you're not gonna power up to win the argument. My encouragement for you is to humbly pray to God and say, God, help my spirit, help my hurt. Help my anger. Help my pride. Like, like all of that sinful stuff within me, God, I, 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 I want that stuff to be put in a small little corner. I, I, I want to handle this with the love and forgiveness like you have loved and forgiven me. And you need to go and seek to understand. You've got to seek to understand. Because maybe you don't understand their motives. Maybe you've developed a dialogue and maybe all of that's not real. Maybe you've applied what you think they've done or haven't done or said and haven't said. Maybe your first step is just to ask some questions so you can try to understand what happened. But that takes humility. And then you got to be willing to own 100% of whatever percentage you own. Maybe in that conflict, that other person should own 99.9%. So you own 100% of the 0.1% you own. Because maybe, just maybe, there's a 0.1% you need to own. And then you got to go expectantly. you got to go expectantly. Expect the best. Expect that it's going to be gain. Expect that the one will be found. And you can celebrate that the relationship will come back together. And that's why you got to pursue reconciliation. you got to be committed to it. That's why Jesus says, leave your your gift at the altar and go and reconcile. There's a debt that's been created. There's been a withdrawal that's been created. And you gotta go and you gotta make it right. You gotta pursue reconciliation to heal that relationship. Again, whether you caused it or you didn't, Jesus both calls us to go, close the gap. And when you go, if you pursue reconciliation, then you're going to understand there's a vast difference between a confrontation and a conversation. So many times when we think about closing the gap, going to that person, it's all about a confrontation. And Jesus is like, no, 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 sit down with them. Have a conversation. Talk with them with humility, with love, with forgiveness, and try to close the gap. And you got to commit to the journey got to commit to the journey. It might not be the first conversation. It might take you a couple. But if you love them, like God loves you, you'll step into it. So, how do you start to walk with someone? Urgently, humbly, expectantly. And next week, we're going to look at what if that person doesn't What if that person refuses to listen? What if that person doesn't want to get healthy themselves? What does that look like? 
That's where we're going with part four. The homework for this week is simply this. Simply this. Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to go to? Now. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask. That we'll be a church. filled with your love and forgiveness that will go to close the gap, to seek forgiveness, to give forgiveness, to reconcile broken, fractured relationships, just like you did for us. In your name I pray.